Support Blackbeard Mirage, the Aboriginal historian. I'm back. Just want to salute everybody out there, all the ladies and gentlemen. You are welcome back into the Mirage universe. And I see you all enjoyed the last tape. I'm very, very glad and ecstatic that you did. You know, dealing with ancient or old American um, history, okay? And how, you know, a lot of the identities were changed and switched around. So if you are a person that, you know, has been labeled um, Negro, Indian, Black, Colored, African American, um, Nigger, etc., you actually are an Aboriginal American, okay? Or an autochthonous American, also known as a Moorish American, all right? Now, salute to the brother in the comment section. He know who he is, the Magi. But, you know, a lot of us, when we talk about Moorish history, you know, we're going to have to kind of change our lens and change our perception of um, and our viewpoint and understand that we're talking about Moorish history of the Americas, that being North, Central, and South America. If you look up a lot of the old documents, if you look at a lot of the old um, government, you know, documents, etc., you will see that a lot of these so-called same Native Americans or Indians are also being referred to as Black Amores, as Moors and Maroons. OK, now, a lot of us know about the Maroons here in the Americas, but see, these are just different words and different usages of the word more, Meru, Maruk, Moro, etc. OK. So we already know about the etymology, but what we need to remember is, is that the MR or this consonant or this continuous, this MR, this usage of the MR, this has been with our ancestors since the times in antiquity. OK, so this MR has always been around. So whether it's the ancient city of Maruk in Chaldea, you know, you have your MR there or if it's your high priest um, of Anu and you know what I'm saying, so-called Egypt, you have your more there. All right. So the word more has always been around, all right? The word Meru has always been around. As far as here in America, it's known as Amaru Maru, okay, or Amarica, all right? So the word America is an ancient word. It comes from Moors, all right? Land of the plumed serpent, dealing with the kundalini energy and the awakening of the third eye, the fire energy in the spine. That's what the word America really is, okay? And it's land of the plumed serpent. It's land of the people who actually have incarnated that sexual fire, that Luciferian fire. The people who know how to do the alchemy to change Saturn, the black coal, into Lucifer, the light, Heru. All right. So that is the ancient science and that is the occult symbolism of America. All right. Not some European, you know what I'm saying, stringy haired Neanderthal named Amerigo Vespucci. That's just one of the Freemasonic lies that were put into the education system to trick people. So today we're going to go a little bit deeper to the history of Georgia, one of my favorite books. This is actually what I'm reading out of, and that's what I read out of in the last tape. You know, thank Mother Mirage. This is from her old college days, believe it or not. But uh, that's where I got this book, The History of Georgia, second edition by, or uh, rather edited by Kenneth Col Coleman. All right. But uh, that's what this book is. And, you know, we're going to read deeper to some Aboriginal American history because a lot of this history is coming and going down uh, right here on the coastal plains of what we call in Georgia, Florida, um, the Carolinas, Virginia, and then you come a little more inland around, of course, Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi, Tennessee, Oklahoma, and then kind of more in your Midwest and bringing it back on to the north around Detroit, Michigan, and then more east back around to what we call um, New York, et cetera. All right. So this, you know, big chunk of land, uh, we can say the entire is really the entire so-called North America, but you know, it, it seems to be that the southeast portion of North America was owned. Well, I don't want to say owned because Aboriginals don't really look at the land like we own it. The, the, the land is owned by itself. The land is its own spiritual being within itself. So nobody owns the land. We really are just thankful to be able to use the land for the, the time that we're here. But it, but it seems to be that the territories that, you know, in the southeast were, were, were being run by, you know, seems like five families um, or or not that many different um, Moorish Aboriginal tribes or Moorish Aboriginal um, families, you know. And I think that they had a lot of sub tribes up under it and a lot of sub nations and sub sectors within it because of, you know, marriage, etc. But ultimately, I think that in the southeast, there probably was no more than five to eight families that really were ruling the whole area. All right. So when these, you know, United States. Um, Christian sons of Yakub, Christian sons and daughters of Yakub, who actually were coming from the south, coming from South America and Central America, coming from the area of the Aztec Aboriginals, our ancestors that they fought down there through the Spanish. 
when these people started to approach or encroach rather uh, coming a little more north, you know, into the land of Florida or Al Andalusia also is another word for it. But coming into that land and dealing with some of the, um, you know, at this time, that you know, different aboriginals that you would find in um, Florida. And then um, it also crept into, you know, Georgia. So you're going to have a lot of conflict and issues with this stuff. And you got to remember that these amalgamated mulattoes that were coming in who were under the Catholic Church were actually the sons and daughters of, you know, Moors of the empire. OK, so you got to when I say the Moorish Empire of the Americas, you got to remember that it's, it's very, very big. All right. You had the Moorish Empire that was in South America. You had the Moorish Empire in Central America. And you had the Moorish Empire in North America. All right. Now, they are all related by bloodlines, but you got to remember that in different phases and different points of pe periods in history, certain empires were activated. So if you want to look more in the ancient, ancient stuff, then around the Yucatan Peninsula in South America, that's going to be your super ancient period. But when a lot of those lands were eroded from basically, you know, our ancestors not switching out certain lands or basically growing certain crops and things on the land too much and the land isn't really you can be used. A lot of these nations, they move on to different places. So this is why you see our people traveling across the entire Americas. You know, this is what was going on. We were really moving because the land, we wanted to make sure we didn't overuse the land and stuff. And the land had to get re refertile. So we would have to go somewhere new. And then when you go somewhere new, you meet an aboriginals in this place or these areas. And then you intermarry with them and stuff. And then you have new sub nations that are created. So although we, t when we talk about the Creek Nation, the Muscogee Nation, um, the Yamasee Nation, the Choctaw Nation, the Blackfoot Nation, etc., you know, Seminole Nation. A lot of these nations really are just subgroups that come from a much larger pool of aboriginals that came from a much greater part of the empire. So when we say the Moorish American or the Aboriginal American or the Autonomous American Empire, we're talking about something that has a span or a period of existence uh, for multiple hundreds of thousands of years. And we are just in a more recent period and we recent window of history when our ancestors um, through the Yakub experiments and through the law of retribution via Saturn, when we had to pay the piper and long story short, the Franciscan slaves, you know, these, you know, Yakubian Neanderthal slaves we had uh, when we amalgamated with them to the point where they were a little more so-called human. Uh, they got past the Cro-Magnon stage and, and they started to somewhat develop themselves. And then, you know, we carved out a, a certain priest class of so-called Caucasian Neanderthals. That um that they got a direct inheritance from a certain group of Moors, and this is who you all know of as the so-called Jews. So the reason why the so-called Jews got somewhat of a jump start, um, a, a, a more so, you know, they got a certain jump start versus the other Caucasian groups that came out of the Caucasus, Neanderthal mountains, and came out of the different various mountains of South America and Central America. The reason why the so-called Jews got a jump start because it was a certain group of particular Moors that invested in them. And these more so happen to be Hebrew and Islamic in, you know, in nature. All right. And come from these old bloodlines. So they had their own group of slaves or serfs or barbarian Neanderthals that they owned, you know, that they probably raised from um, the test tube stage all the way to the grown adult Neanderthal stage. And just the descendants of these Neanderthals were continuously owned by the different inheritance and the different heirs of the original blood, the original more scientists that created this uh, strand of Neanderthal. So, you know, as time went on, when the different wars happened and stuff, they started amalgamating, you know, and then the bloodline is bleached out. Um, the melanin is bleached out. So now you have this new, you know, family calling themselves Rothschild, who are so-called Jewish, who have now inherited the wealth from King Solomon's tomb. You see, this is all really esoteric, you know, history to show that the Moorish bloodline was bleached out from within. So whenever you hear me say that, that our bloodline was bleached out from within, what I'm saying is, is that we were amalgamating with these different basically servants and slaves that we had and then producing offspring with them. And then now inheritances and resources are passed on to these offspring. You know, they're learning the knowledge of the, you know, their forefather or the foremother or whatever. And now all of a sudden you have this new group of people that are calling themselves Moors, but they are, they look a whole lot lighter you know, they're amalgamated and, and they have switched and changed around the Moorish culture. So it's not the traditional Moorish culture anymore. So now you have a new form of Islam. It's not that the science of Islam, you know what I'm saying? It's not the higher principles of Islam no more. Now you have more of this dogma, more of this religion thing, more of this whole thing that's really about money and just subjugating people, you know. 
So all this is just a history that kind of led into a lot of the wars that happened here on America. Um, you know, it was from the wars that happened and stemmed, stemmed from the, you know, Yakub experiment. So when you hear about the even the Spanish and Mexican War, when you hear about the Aztec Mexican War or the Aztec and the Spanish War. Um, when you hear about the different Jamaican and the wars, the wars in so-called Jamaica, when you hear about the French Revolution and all this different stuff, it's still all extension of the Yakubian experiment. All right. So right now we're going to go into Georgia and go into the periods of 1775 to 1820 and look into the war that was between the Aboriginal Creeks and these invading Caucasians. Let's look into it. Georgia's hope of securing something from her vast western domain, mainly inhabited by Indians, is illustrated by the unsuccessful attempts at the creation of two counties far to the west of the line of the settlement. Also, although you hear me saying Indians, we know who we're talking about. We're talking about so-called black people who are wearing turbans with feathers, okay, and wearing crown feathers, all right, just like them two feathers you see in front of you with that skull. It's the reason why I have the cotton and it's the reason why I have those feathers. Why do I have the cotton? Because I'm from Aboriginal America. I'm from the Aboriginal South of Georgia. This is where my ancestors are from. And the cash crop was, was cotton here. We weren't really growing the tobacco here. That was up in the Carolinas. So the cotton was here, you see. So my people owned the cotton. You know, we weren't picking the cotton. We owned the cotton. And then when some of us had wars and we were made prisoners of war, we were forced into a life of being agrarians for these Caucasians. And that's what you all know of as us picking cotton. But anyway, let's continue. In 1784, land speculators petitioned for a new county, Houston, to be located at the Muscle Shoals area of the Tennessee River. In 1787, this was the area in which land was to be granted to men from the state of Franklin, men who it was hoped would join Georgia in her anticipated war against the Creeks. But the war did not materialize. The land grants were never made and the county was never created. The attempted founding of a Bourbon County in the Natchez district on the Mississippi seems more fantastic. This county, which was actually created in 1785, was backed by land speculators in the area. But the Spanish in control of this territory made it clear that they wanted no new Georgia County or settlers. So ended Bourbon County. So what you have right here is basically you have a group of Caucasians. Uh, who are coming in under the United States and the Spanish. And they are trying to carve out certain areas in Georgia where they want to create counties for themselves. So this is why it's also said in the previous tape on how a lot of these political campaigns, just like how you will see Obama and his whole political campaign would be, let's say, change. Um, or you may have Donald Trump and his whole campaign may, may be make America great again. Well, back th in these times, in the 17 and early 1800s, a lot of the political campaigns were centered around killing the aboriginal well, people that you call Negroes and Indians or blacks, but killing these people and, and kicking them out and making them, you know, be, be victims of mass exodus and being kicked out of their own lands. These were the terror. These were a lot of the political campaigns and these were the people that were being financed and had money put behind them. And this is another thing, too. That same cherished group of Caucasian Jews that I talked about a little while ago, these this group of people were responsible for much of the early financing of the um, original United States Corporation. All right. So you got to remember that any Caucasian group that you see in this planet or any amalgamated group that you see or any bleached out so-called tribe, ethnicity, nationality or people you see on this planet. Don't never forget that at the base of all their financing. You will find this Caucasian Jewish group of Neanderthal bloodline descent that I'm talking about. They will be somewhere in the mix um, of the financing and, and have a control of that operation. And the reason why they have this ability is because of what these original Moors put them in this position. So this is why you see the so-called Jew involved in everything. And this is why he follows the Aboriginal around especially the Moors of America. This is why he's always involved in everything we're doing. He's always trying to invest in finance, everything we're doing, because because of this, you know, old Moorish bloodline and, and through this Yakub experiment, this is he's he don't know anything up but to kind of do things like we do and to try to associate himself with us because he don't know how to make money without us. You see what I'm saying? So these ways that you see the Jewish community today of how they don't like to amalgamate with other people but they promote it to other people to destroy their communities. That is actually something that some of these old Moors were doing. Okay. So everything that you see them doing, we actually, 
you know, was doing to them at some point. Because you got to remember now, it was a point in time where they were all, you know, slouched over, had a bunch of hair on them, and they were still in that Yakub Neanderthal stage. So it was a lot of rules in the community to where you can't amalgamate with these people or be seen with these people or you'll get killed or arrested or et cetera. You know, so this is where these certain customs come from or why how these Jews don't want to amalgamate with people and why they seem like they want to keep their thing pure because these old Moors, that's how they were thinking, you know, because they didn't want to amalgamate with these um, rhesus monkey virus um, Caucasians. Let's continue. So here we have right here. Basically, you have these people trying to come into Georgia. And this is is creating and it's starting to um, puff up a war against the Creek Aboriginals who were in Georgia. So this is a, a key group that was in Georgia is the Creek Aboriginals. And when they say in Creek, they're talking about basically these main creeks and, and, and different rivers and these different tribes that were having communities and living around these rivers. All right. And it was located mainly in the western parts of Georgia. All right. The western parts of Georgia. So it could be as far north, you know what I'm saying, as as. Uh, around Atlanta, etc., you know, but mainly in the areas of what we know of as like Columbus, um, in, in like Muskogee County and stuff like that. You know what I'm saying? Just the western parts of Georgia and also the 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 far eastern parts of Alabama. All right. So these Creek Aborigines, this is what we're talking about. So where am I? At? Here we go. It says. Both Georgia's quick action and unanimous vote in favor of the Constitution can be attributed to her relation with the Creek Indians. Her greatest problem in 1787 was a threatened Creek War, and Georgia needed help if she was to defeat the Indians. Let me repeat this part, because a lot of people don't really know the full story of why it seemed like we actually were overwhelmed. The reason why is because these Caucasians had to come and create united nations. They had to create united groups to fight us. So it would be something like this. So you would have, let's say, the Spanish. You would have the Dutch. You have the Portuguese. And let's say you have the British. Now, mind you, these are all Caucasian people. All bleached out, you know what I'm saying, so-called Moorish people. But they all have their own culture, heritage, and they all speak their own language. The Dutch man speaks his language. You know, the, the British man speaks his language, etc. But... When they were coming across these different aboriginals, these aboriginals, not only did they have the same kind of families, but these families were much, much larger, much greater than what they expected. I mean, it was hundreds of thousands of them, if not millions of them. And then on top of that, they also saw that these families were were linked by bloodline and were intermarrying with other families. So it was a whole lot more of them, you see. So you're not just going to be dealing with one group of Creek Indians. You're going to be dealing with a whole, let's say, certain part of the river. All the Creek Indians that may live on this certain part of the river because they have what's known as confederacies. OK, now a confederacy could be a certain nation or a certain sub nation that's made up of a bunch of different groups of families and clans and tribes. But they all are under one banner, let's say. So this is the problem that a lot of these Caucasian Europeans had on uh, the, the blonde haired sons and daughters of Yaku. These are a lot of the problems they had. They started seeing that, OK, if I'm coming with my faction as the Spanish and I want to just get territory just for the Spanish. But I can't really defeat all these aborigines or who these Indians. I can't defeat them on my own like that. You know, the British coming in, the British, when they fight and they're not trying to get territory and then have to share it with the Dutch and share it with the Portuguese and share it with all these different people. But they seeing that when it's just them, they can't really defeat these aboriginals like that. So what they did was they started to kind of collectively unite based on this whole faction that we know of as white supremacy. And it started being more about the skin being more what this shit really is about. So, yeah, we'll battle each other and we'll have our little issues with the Dutch and the Spanish. You know what I'm saying? Or the France and French and British fighting for land. We'll have our little fights amongst each other. But we're only going to do that on the back end after we have collectively come together to fight against these aboriginal Moors. Because they are on a united front. And they aren't, you know, coming as separate as we are. You know, with this faction as the Dutch, the Portuguese, etc., they come in as a nation of aboriginals. And that's what they don't want you all to know. They want you all to think that, you know, we came to them fighting them all split up and stuff like that in, in the Tower of Babel state. That's not how we came to them. We came to them as a nation fighting. And they just saw that these nations were made up of a bunch of different sub nations and sub families within this one big nation. And they started to see like, wait a minute, this this is going to be a problem. 
So this is what they saw. And this is when, when you get things like her greatest problem in 1787. They talk about Georgia and the, and the English settlers who tried to come in here and steal land. They saying that her greatest problem in 1787 was a threatened Creek War and Georgia needed help if she was to defeat the Indians. So it's saying right here that they couldn't defeat these people on their own. So a lot of these Negro women or a lot of these so-called black women, when they say things like, well, all the black man didn't help us during slavery and well, all the black man didn't fight for us and all the black man just let us get captured and raped and all the black man just bent over and just got sodomized and all the black man just was working and he didn't fight. See, this is the shit they don't want you all to know about. Um, now I'm talking to the women because these are the wars that I'm sitting here talking about. I just said that this shit is 1787. When they show you all the so-called slave history, aren't, aren't we supposed to be slaves in the late 1700s? So if this is the case, then why do you got Creek Aborigines who really are blacks and Negroes? Why do you have them fighting against the so-called invaders of, you know, the land that we're going to later call Georgia? And they saying that these people need help. So that's what I'm saying. This is why they had to create what's known as the United States, which basically is just like no different than a European Union. It's just a, a group of Christian nations, of Caucasian Christian nations, the blonde haired, blue eyed sons and blonde haired, red haired, blue eyed sons and daughters of Yakub, the Christian nations. That's what the United States is. That's their version of like the Iroquois Confederacy. You know what I'm saying? Or, you know, or like the, 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 the. The five civilized tribes or something. It's like that's their version of it. The United States It's made of the British. It's made of the Italian, you know, who's really just a bleached out more. But it's made of the Belgium people, you know, and it's made of, of, you know, the Germans or whoever or whoever. It's like the United States is a collective Caucasian Christian group, you see. And they had they had to come together like that in order to fight the Moorish Aboriginal nation from America. So this is why it's not the British states of America. You know, this is why it's not the French states of America. This is why it's not the Belgium states of America. This is why it's not the Portuguese states of America. This is why it's not the Spanish states of America, because these individual little countries couldn't defeat us. This is, this is what I'm trying to drive in y'all's head. They couldn't defeat you all like that. You all was way too united and it was way too many of you all. So they had to not only come together like that, but then they still didn't have enough people. So even when they had the different United States and they came together based on their skin color and based on the doctrine of Mary and Christ, even after they did that, they still didn't have enough people. So they, then they had to start trying to find aboriginals who were disgruntled within our communities and get them to sell out. So that's when you start having your dirty moors come in. At. OK, so your dirty moor, one of your original dirty moors on this land is an aboriginal who went a turban with feathers in his head, just like you see in front of you. Your original dirty moor is him. That same Aboriginal who's disgruntled and he sees that these Portuguese or these Spanish or whoever in Louisiana trying to come in and he wants to run over and team up with them. And then I'm going to tell you this, too. A lot of the ones who were selling out, they were amalgamated and they were mixed. And that's another thing they ain't really showing you in the history books, too, that a lot of the people that they wanted to do treaties with, you know, and a lot of the people that the United States and these Caucasians wanted to do business with. They wanted to do business with the mixed or the amalgamated aboriginals. They didn't want to do business with the full-blooded Moors that were from here. Because these full-blooded Moors wasn't fucking with them like that. So they would go and get some mixed out, amalgamated, let's say, Creek or Choctaw or Yamasee, right? And then they would do a treaty with him. And then they would get that one mixed, amalgamated, fake Yamasee to speak on behalf of the entire Yamasee nation. And now they're going to put in the history books and say that the United States did a land deal or a treaty with the Yamasee Nation. Whereas it was just a bunch, it was probably two or three amalgamated, you know what I'm saying, um, you know, so called Native Americans, you know, dealing with a group of so called Caucasian people that's calling themselves the British or the United States. And they signed some little paper, and now all of a sudden in the history books, they're telling you that it was this big deal, but it wasn't. You know, like they talk about the Louisiana Purchase with the whole United States and the French. They didn't own that land. You see what I'm saying? That shit really never legally even happened. You know, the, the main reason why it didn't happen because they didn't own the land. Did The United States didn't own it, nor did the fucking French own it. So this is what I mean. These people have always been coming here trying to steal the land. That's what it's always about. It's about stealing the land. All right. So check this out. So it says. 
So it says both Georgia's quick action and unanimous votes in favor of the Constitution can be attributed to her relation with the Creek Indians. Her greatest problem in 1787 was a threatened Creek War, and Georgia needed help if she was to defeat the Indians. As she had not been able to secure the desired aid from the old Confederation or from other states, many Georgians hoped that the new and stronger central government would be helpful. The upcountry could hope for protection while Savannah and the coast desired better trade regulations. Thus, the entire state united in favor of the new constitution. So what you also have going on here is, is this. See, you got to remember that at this point in time, these Caucasian people were not consolidated fully under one united front yet. So although I just broke down the history of what the United States would ultimately become when they got organized. But you got to remember at this point, they trying to fight aboriginals and steal land from us. And at the same time, they fighting each other and trying to, you know, fight over who going to get the stolen land from us. So they weren't really fully united yet. So at this time, there really wasn't a, like a state of Georgia or a state of Alabama or a state of Florida in this Georgia Constitution or this Florida Constitution or this Alabama Constitution that all these Caucasians were agreeing upon. This stuff didn't really exist like that. A lot of these constitutions that these states, especially in the South, they were all founded on these people coming together to steal land from us. So this is why you why you get Caucasians in Tennessee that see, OK, you know, in order for us to get these this land from these aborigines in Tennessee and this land we call in Tennessee, we're going to have to create, let's say, certain guidelines, regulations, codes and standards and ways that we're going to do things as a united front. Because once again, these people are united. So this this so the history is kind of showing us that this is why they always focus on um, splitting doing the Adam and Eve ritual with so-called black people and, and making sure we always and also the Tower of Babel uh, ritual to make sure we always are split amongst ourselves and make sure we're not really ever united because they they know that when whenever we are this way, a we're hard to defeat and b we start once again, that empire starts rising again. So. The, the things were really reversed. So the same way today, like as a so-called black man, a black woman, you feel insecure because you think like, damn, you know, we're not together really as a people. If something were to go down in this country, you know, so-called black people would be thrown in FEMA camps because we not together. The men arguing with the women, you know what I'm saying? Um, we don't really got no army. We don't have no resources like that. You know what I'm saying? Uh, all our women just got children and they would be alone. Like, man, that's messed up. And just all this worrying. The same way that we are like that today, this is how these Caucasians were when they first met us here. And the same way that we perceive Caucasians today to have their shit together, you know, to have it to where whenever it's a hurricane, they got boats, to have it to where they got bank accounts and insurance, to have it to where they got a military and things equipped to defeat them, I mean, to defeat other people, to have it to where when they have little problems amongst each other, where it's Caucasian men and Caucasian men or Caucasian women and Caucasian men to where they could kind of fight on the back end but on the front end they come as united front to go against other ethnicities and nationalities that same way like they seem so organized that's how we were back then so once again it's the jacob and esau ritual and this is what they did they flipped the the mentalities and they flipped the, the way of life you see what i'm saying this that primary also the primary jacob and esau ritual was between these um old moors and then these caucasians that they raised up to, that we call the so-called jews today this was a major Jacob and Esau ritual because when they raised these Caucasians up, when they gave them this ancient Judaism, when they taught them Zoroastrianism, when they taught them the ancient Persian sciences, when they made them the freed and accepted Masons, you see what I'm saying? When they gave them the keys to Hiram Biff's tomb, when they gave them the tools of Yeshua's workshop, you see what I'm saying? When they gave them the, 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 the wisdom of King Solomon, when they did all this shit to these Caucasian barbarians and raised them up like that. Then, in turn, they now became the barbarian. Now they became the Negro. Now they become the black. You see what I'm saying? Now they become the colored. Now they become the slave. Now they become the poor man. You see how that go? So it's the trading places ritual. The Esau and Jacob ritual. The aboriginal old Moor traded his birthright for a bowl of lentil soup. He traded his status as an aboriginal that's already connected to the land. That already is a beneficiary of birthright and inheritance it has been so for thousands of years through the ancient hebrew bloodlines you see what i'm saying this 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 aboriginal man who already had all that who had all the gold he traded all of that to raise up his neanderthal slave you see what i'm saying his his um caucasian 
you know, pale monkey, his pale manky slave. He traded all that in order to raise his pale manky up, to clothe his pale manky, to teach his pale manky his own sciences. And then worse on top of a lot of all, uh, it really worse than all that to allow this pale manky to sleep with his woman. When you when he did all that, this is the Jacob and Esau ritual. You know, he traded his birthright for a bowl of lentil soup. So all this shit that I'm talking about, this stuff all happened on the American soil, the lands of Georgia, Alabama, Florida, Virginia, Tennessee, the Carolinas, you know what I'm saying? Louisiana, Mississippi, this shit happened right here. This is what we talking about. All this ritual stuff I'm talking about, all this Moorish history I'm talking about, this stuff happened right here on American soil, North, Central and South America, not across the Atlantic. So when you hear me talk about Moors, I'm talking about the Aboriginal Americans. And even if I'm talking about Islamic Moors, I'm still talking about the Aboriginal Americans. Because most of these so-called slave revolts, which you all don't know, they were actually Islamic in nature. That's right. A lot of the original slave revolts that the Spanish and the Portuguese were dealing with here in Americas, they were Islamic in nature. So these same Moors that you all thought got kicked out of Spain... These same Moors, these was the Aboriginal Moors here that was on the same shit, dealing with the same Islamic sciences. You know. So this is um, this is the history. So when we say in Moors, we talking about these Aboriginal Americans, the people from Amaru Maru, the Serpentine people. Cause that's another thing. See, a Moor is also a serpent. You gotta remember that now. A moor is also a serpent. Let me show you, give you an example of what I'm talking about. So right now you're going to have the Christ principle of Heru in front of you. And on the front of his um, solar disk, you see a serpent. That serpent is the Negu or the Nagas. Or today what we call the niggas. This is why I use the word niggas and I really only, you know, I refer to y'all as that. You know what I'm saying? And have y'all noticed that so-called black people, whenever we call other people niggas, we only usually we usually do it in an antagonistic point of view. You know, so if I call a Caucasian a nigger, I'm, that's more the, the troglodyte Niger. You see what I'm saying? The black manky that he is, you know, the Negro manky, you know. But if I see a brother on my on the street and I say, oh, that's my nigga right there. I'm talking about the Nagas. I'm talking about Heru. So it has a dual meaning. OK, but the Nagas or that serpent or the American that's what that is. Quetzalcoatl, the plume serpent. And that's what you see right there on the crown of Heru. All right. Did I tell you all that Heru was the American Christ? Okay. So what's the boy Blackbeard, real ab aboriginal, I talked in his history. American history right here on this soil. No need to look to Africa. No need to look to Europe. All right. Stay tuned. I'm out.